Hello and welcome to season two, episode 21, the season two finale of Dualistic Unity. I will be playing the part of Andrew today. And I am not what you think. And I just wanted to start this episode with that because it has taken us 35 episodes approximately and some round tables and a bunch of live streams to actually get to the point where Andrew and I met in person this previous weekend uh, in Nanaimo or on Vancouver Island. We spent the weekend hanging out and getting to know each other. It was quite the journey, but I think the most important part about us actually coming together and meeting face to face was getting rid of any assumption that there might be as a result of us only having limited uh, amounts of communication through Zoom, not really having the ability to just let down our guard and be ourselves because there was always a limited amount of time that we had to make the most of. And so we tried to be as insightful or as concise as possible, whereas with Andrew being here, we could just be, watch the time go by and see what unfolded. And so I'm super curious to get uh, Andrew's thoughts on his weekend here, but I just wanted to weigh in and say that from the very start, it was exactly what I wanted it to be, which was a journey into letting go of our idea of each other. Whatever assumptions we had left, the entire point of meeting was to realize that they're just assumptions, that we're both exactly human beings with things to deal with and questions and answers and all kinds of stuff in our journey. And so I really appreciated the chance to meet you, Andrew. And I really hope that I destroyed any idea that you had of me. You certainly did. Yes. And I won't dive into too much detail. We will leave that for the retreat for people to find out if they're interested in that um, and seeing what we're like in person. Cause I don't think either of us are, are exactly what you may think that we are through just a podcast or even just our content. Cause as much as we share on those, it's still a fraction of a percentage of what we are. And, and you can't really get that. You can only glean even specific senses or, or ideas of someone through that. There's so many other aspects of our interactions as human beings that just can't be even portrayed, even if we wanted to fully through audio or video or pictures or any sort of content that it just doesn't, it's just not the same as the human to human interaction. So even something like, you know, metaverse or virtual reality, it's never going to be that true reality. But um, yeah, I think this, is a, this weekend, similar to Ray was exactly what I was, what I was hoping for. And yet I had no expectations at the same time. So it was what I wanted without even knowing that I wanted it or, or expected anything about it. But yeah, I think, I think Ray, it's funny because even now, even now that we're back to, to being on the computer on zoom, it's like my old idea of him is sort of coming back, but it was absolutely smashed this weekend. And, you know, I'm not going to share too much, but, um, yeah, he, Ray, Ray is a human being. I will, I will say that he is, I had this idea that he was a Eckhart Tolle level enlightened master being sort of thing without even really recognizing how much of that I had in my head. And, and, and now I honestly think of him closer to how I think of some of my best friends that I live with in New York. Cause that was kind of the conversations that we were having were just human conversations like guys being guys talking about different random stuff and, and just having a good time smoking some weed, taking some mushrooms and, and just really just enjoying ourselves. We watched a bunch of movies, went on a bunch of walks. We ended up walking 37 miles only between Friday and Saturday. Yeah. We walked 18 and a half miles per day. It was almost 67,000 steps. So it's funny when two people who are big walkers get together because, and walkers and talkers, because that's what's going to happen. We just walked and talked and then took some time to watch the movies and do all the other stuff. But yeah, it was, it was funny. So absolutely. Yeah. I think moving forward, it'll be fun because season three, seeing each other for more of, of closely of what we actually are um, without those assumptions that are just rooted in very limited access to what we actually are. Um, 
those are gone for the most part. So it'll be fun to, to see the next, the next season and even just this episode, how it shakes out. Absolutely. Um, what I really enjoyed about, I guess, this experience that we had over the weekend was the fact that it's very much why we want to have the retreat the way that we want to have the retreat. And what I mean by that is that the rooms are shared at the retreat with the exception of one king bed, which is already booked. All of the other rooms are shared. It's either a double bed and a single bed or a queen bed and a single bed or two double beds. And so the point of the retreat is not just to get away. It's not just to have a chance to talk to Andrew and I. It's a chance to break down your own barriers. It's a chance to see yourself in other people who are different from you to slowly day by day recognize that these people are you. They're your brothers and your sisters. They are your other incarnations and in that it's only your preferences and maybe your fears that stop you from being able to relate to them. And so over the course of the retreat, those fears will gradually disappear. And by the end of it, we will all know that we are brothers and sisters in this. And that is the point of the retreat. So I'm very much looking forward to that. Yeah, me too. Because it's it's one thing to be, and even for us, and I think for everyone on Discord that interacts so much, we probably have just based on different people's messages, some idea of ourselves. And I asked Ray this weekend, because I was just like, wow, you are, you're not exactly what I thought you were. Is it, I asked him if it's possible to not have an idea of someone. And while it may not be possible to garner some idea just sort of automatically when when you interact with someone or when someone says something to you or you meet someone, you can still recognize that you don't have to take it as the truth. And, and you can recognize that it, it's still you making an assumption. So you don't have to give it the weight that you might have before you recognize that. And you can see that your perception and your judgment about someone, even though it's bound to happen, you can recognize that it isn't the reality of what they are. And so that I think helps and will help me moving forward, just because as much as I work on not having an idea of someone, I have interacted and spoke with Ray a ton. And I still was like fucking way off on my idea of him. And it was very funny, but also very freeing. And I'm so happy that we got the chance to interact for the past four days. Cause I think it'll, it, it'll have a massive impact on this podcast moving forward. And I think it only reinforces my excitement for the retreat, because I think a lot of you, you know, there's already a bunch of you who've signed up. There's only, you know, a very limited amount of spots left, but it'll be cool for you to see us beyond the veil of, of what you think you are based on the types of videos we make and the things we talk about, because at the end of the day, we're both just pretty normal human beings. As much as we recognize that I am God, it's still in a human incarnation. And there's aspects of that that are pretty uniform across everyone, things you struggle with, things you deal with, things that excite you, all that stuff is, is rooted in the human experience. So I'm excited to, to interact with all the other incarnations of me that'll be there. And the fact that everyone will recognize that it's, that it's just me. There's nowhere to go. There's nothing you have to become. It's just how much you're committed to what you think you are. And the more you let that go, the more you recognize what you really are. And that pit or, or that hole, that, that journey, whatever you want to call it, is endless. The more you let go of yourself or the idea of yourself or, or the perception of division from the rest of your experience, the more you recognize that you are the entirety of the experience, that it really is just you. And that you are vast, limitless, and, and all there will ever be. But you can't see that until you let go of your belief that you are what you think. Because that, that idea of yourself is what causes that division. It's what disempowers you. It's, it's what makes you feel lack. It's what makes you feel afraid. Most of our, our human experience is based on that perception of division. 
Which makes sense. I mean, before we become aware of ourselves as everything, we go through this physical process of just trying to survive and procreate and do all that. And that's just physicality expressing itself in duality. And so the more we become aware of ourselves, the more we recognize that while my physical form perceives and experiences itself dualistically, it's looking for a mate, it's looking for food, it's trying to survive, it fears death, all of that. The awareness that it is running on and embodying doesn't do any of that. It doesn't fear any of that because that awareness is life itself. That awareness has all forms, every form throughout all time and space and will never, ever die. And so there is this dichotomy to our experience between the perception of being separate and physical and alone to the recognition that none of that is true and none of those words mean a thing. Yeah, it's fascinating just that confusion and how prevalent it is in our society and like that that is the root of of all of it the confusion that you are what you think you are that you are this idea of what you think you are like that that is that is the root of all of our suffering is the confusion that we aren't god that we aren't everything that we are just this limited idea that was born and that will die and has something to defend and something to gain and something to fear and something to lose. And the reality is that you've never been that. And it's not, it's not a belief because it can be, we, we logically explain it. We express how that is the case when you're able to peel back all of those assumptions and beliefs that you identify with, because the reality is even something like a name, that's a, that's a pretty easy one. Like we identify with our name. Someone will say like, oh, well, yeah, you are Andrew though. It's like, am I? It's just a name I was given. I could have just as easily, easily been Jack or John or Joey or Sarah or literally anything or bleh. Could have been called that, you know? Like it could have been anything. And it's not what I am because that was just a sound that has been attached in order to more easily communicate with me, but it was never what I was. And so if you're able to peel back those things that you think that you are like a name, your past, your likes and dislikes, your affiliations to certain belief systems or political ideologies, because those are never, those aren't what you actually are. And you recognize that, you know, your atoms are getting replaced all the time, every couple of years. It's, it's not that hard to get to a point where you begin to recognize a little bit more clearly that you aren't what you think you are, but people don't go there. People just settle on that assumption because everyone does. And it's, it's the argument I hear a lot for something like Catholicism or Christianity. Oh, well, there's, you know, what do you mean? There's, there's billions of people who believe in it. And, and that it's like, that's not, that's not a good argument just because a lot of people are confused. Doesn't mean that you're right. And it, it's not that hard to get to a point where you peel those back and you see what you actually are. So it's not just a belief. Like people are saying, believe what you want to believe, blah, blah, blah. But it's like, this isn't a belief. It's, it's the recognition of what you actually are beyond all of the fictions that you believe yourself to be and all the things that you attach to that you believe yourself to be because none of them are you can you can peel all of them back until what what you're left with is just this moment not even anything having to do with this moment so if you're willing to ask the questions and you're willing to go there and let go of what you think you are you can get to a point that you recognize that oh oh shit i i am everything i am god but People don't want to go there because they have to let go. They have to question and it can be uncomfortable, but it beyond that, and it, it can be scary because it's so unknown, but beyond that is more freedom than you've ever experienced. And the beauty is that once you let all of it go, you're still here. You're still here now. What's left is what you actually are. And in that you can still do whatever you want. You can do even more because you're free. You're not confined to that idea, not confined to those limits. So if you haven't questioned much yet, although if you've gotten to this point in the podcast, you've probably done some questioning, but I urge you 
too. Just give it a shot. And when it gets uncomfortable, just recognize that you'll be okay. And, and, you know, we're here to chat too. If you ever, you know, want to chat on Patreon, we do that a few times a month, but I, it's, it's the most freeing thing I've ever recognized. So I hope, I hope you give it a shot. Yeah. That was definitely the thing that I kept coming up with over and over and over again over the weekend was that this is it. This conversation is the best thing that I can do for anyone because it's the conversation that results from me peeling back the layers. I'm not trying to get anywhere. I'm not trying to sway anyone. I don't need followers. I certainly don't need you to believe me. What I'm doing is just working through the distortion, working through all, all the layers that I still hold on to as being believable, I guess. And I think that's the problem with this journey is that you actually have to maintain your, your uh, commitment, I guess you could say to it, or your focus on the fact that there is this insight, there is this recognition that you keep coming to and peeling away at, but it's there because when you get lost in your stuff, tend, you tend to forget that that insight is there, that it was real. You'll disregard it as, oh, I was just, I don't know, I was young and naive, or I was on drugs or, or something like that. But that insight is there. And it's important to recognize that the insight that you are everything isn't quite true because that still implies that there, there is a you. So your recognition of that insight or your recognition of the flow that you're experiencing is going to be determined to your resistance to that insight. The more of you you're holding on to, the harder the flow seems to hit you instead of carry you. So the more you let yourself go, just as truth, that's all there is to it. It's not letting yourself go like, oh, I don't need anything. I don't want anything. I don't. It's just letting go of the truth of it. So that way the, the, the need and the lack isn't what's driving you. That's all it is. And as you do that, you start to recognize that everything in your life is a, an opportunity for you to express your potential. But you can't see that potential while you're putting walls around it and telling yourself those walls are real because you are that powerful. You actually can do that. You are powerful enough to limit your limitlessness. Damn. Powerful enough to limit your limitlessness. That's, that's powerful. That is very well said, but it is so true how fascinating it is that as God, we can convince ourselves that we aren't like we've gotten to that point that we are so all knowing and all powerful that we can convince ourselves that we're not what we are. And obviously there's, there's layers to that. And over, you know, over the perception of years, there's been a lot of distortion that has led to making it more difficult to recognize. And even, you know, the human forms that we embody, you know, we're just, the universe in the shape of a human, as Ray mentioned this weekend, and then we talked about for a bit. Um, but yeah, it's so with that recognition that that we're human, that distortion and, and the uh, complexity of it only reinforces more of that sense of duality because we're so complex. We're like, oh well, I, you know, I think certain thoughts and you can't hear my thoughts. And so, you know, therefore we're separate. Boom. Easy. It's like, whoa, wait, wait a second. They're just thoughts. You're the one believing that they're your thoughts. They're not your thoughts. They're just thoughts. Your feelings are just feelings. They're not your feelings. And as you begin to let go of that idea of yourself, you realize that the feelings that you feel, whether they're inside or outside your body or, or perceived to be inside or outside your body, or, or whether there's noises that you can hear, whether they're inside your head or outside their head, it's both all you and not you. But the confusion comes when we think that only the quote unquote internal is you and the external is not you. Cause there's also so many things inside of you that you don't necessarily identify with like you do, but you don't. 
in terms of processes like digestion or, or heartbeat or things like that. Like you're not doing those things. Like you are as the whole doing those things, but you as the ego are not. But so we pick and choose the things that we identify with and that leads to more and more confusion. But we, when you can see that there's certain things, when you, when you can recognize that you are picking and choosing the things that you identify with, it's easier to see that it isn't you. And then once you let some of those go, you kind of come full circle. Once you let go of what you think you are, you realize that there are no bounds to what you are. And if you're not what you think you are, then there are no bounds to that identity. And then there's nothing that you aren't in a way, but yeah, it, it takes that questioning. The most important part is just continuing to question what you think you are recognizing that you never are that. Yeah. Because the danger is that the more you see, the more you recognize, the more you start to realize that your idea of yourself isn't the truth, the more free you, you feel. But then you also have this temptation to come up with a bigger, better idea now that you don't feel so restricted. Now you want to put yourself up at the top of the pedestal, like, look how, how clear I am by virtue of my insight, my place is above everybody else who isn't as aware. And then you end up with so-called spiritual teachers and masters who, by virtue of them deciding that is my label, have stopped themselves from actually embodying reality itself. They've put themselves at the top of a structure. They've divided themselves from everybody beneath. And in my opinion, or as, as a result of what I've seen over the years, seriously diminish what all of the people they're talking to can get out of what they're saying because there is that barrier. And I'm specifically talking about so-called spiritual gurus. And I wanna refer back to something that Andrew was experiencing over the weekend with another TikTok account. I know we talked about this a bit on Discord, um, but specifically this TikTok creator, and I've watched some of his content, some of it's good. I mean, it's, it's pretty run of the mill stuff. You can read it in almost every self-help book. So that, that's great. Th those insights are very helpful, but at the core of it is this idea that he is the important part of this movement, that he should be the leader. By 45, he's going to have a spiritual empire. He's going to have all of these followers, right? And so there's a lot of him. Whereas I know with Andrew and I talking about this over the weekend, we were very clear about the fact that it's you, you, the listener, you're the point. Andrew and I are just doing our own thing, right? And you're us. The more you progress, the more we progress. Right? There is no you and I. It's all just what is. And, and the more you recognize that, the more people you will end up being able to communicate with and empathize with and relate to. And the more people won't get turned off by this idea that you are above them. Because that is the danger. It might sound tempting, but it does more damage than good. Yeah, and it can be very tempting, as Ray was just saying, as you shed that negative idea of yourself and build up a positive idea of yourself. It can be very tempting to settle on that, but it's still very much limiting your infinite potential that you have in every single moment. And it also leaves you with something to still defend and something to lose still and something to get angry and frustrated about and you know, feel bad about almost if someone were to call you out for something and call you out on some bullshit that you're talking about. So that message, one of the videos um, he posted was about how basically that it was like a minute long video, but the part that I sort of stitched was he was saying that July is going to be a very pivotal month for you. We have a lot of good things coming. And although it seemed like maybe it isn't right now, July is going to be very pivotal. And I responded, I was kind of, you know, messing around trying to be a little bit funny with it. But I said, uh, basically, July doesn't exist. July is completely made up. July is just a infinite number of moments between two arbitrary moments that we label as July. But July isn't the truth. And so had some people, 
I had one guy uh, who I'm friends with through TikTok stitch it. And he was like dying laughing because he loves calling out spiritual bullshit also. And it, it triggered a lot of people, especially the original creators followers. And they came out in force and I'm still getting comments. I was getting comments on like a handful of my other videos. And I had one where I mentioned how Ray and I have this beyond belief workshop coming up in July and people were commenting like, Oh, but July doesn't exist. And it's like, Oh Jesus. Yeah. And I would clarify. And I try, I got to a point, I actually did draft up another video stitching his response. And today I was just like, you know what? I can let this go. I don't need, it's not my responsibility to clarify everything for everyone and mention the issues and pitfalls and consequences of messages like that. Like I don't have to go out and try and change everyone, but it was interesting to see the response because the video, the original creator stitched my friend's video of him like laughing. And he said, you know, how, oh, these bullies are just giving me free, free publicity. And it doesn't bother me as I build my empire. Like I have to thank them. My haters are my motivators, all that fucking bullshit. And it was interesting though, because none of his video had anything to do with what I said in my video about how July doesn't actually exist because he probably recognizes that he doesn't. And it fucking fascinates me that people, because so many creators come up with those videos like July is coming. Oh, December is going to change your life. August 8th is going to be, oh, I can't wait till August 8th. I'm going to stitch like, I'll probably stitch eight videos on August 8th being like, this is bullshit. This is bullshit. July 8th doesn't actually exist. It's just right now. But the the crux of it, which I didn't communicate in that video, because I was just fucking around. I just thought it was a funny video. I made it like while I was eating my lunch. You can see me chewing in the video almost or like picking shit out of my teeth. It was very casual. So I, did, I didn't think of it like, oh, this is going to become like a big deal and get like 500 comments. But the main the main root of believing someone like that, that says July is going to be very pivotal is that it takes away from your, the recognition that you have that ability to do whatever it is you want to do with your life right now, because right now is all there ever is July tomorrow, tomorrow, July comes sort of, but it's still an arbitrary set of moments, but tomorrow never comes. It's always right now, an hour, you never experience an hour from now you experience right now. So right now is the only place you ever have the ability to make change as, as the rudder of the ship, as they say. And as, as you believe people who say July's pivotal, you're like, oh, okay, I'll, I'll just wait for July. And then it's like, oh, I can't wait for July. I'm excited for July. And it, it takes away from your experience here and now, your experience right now, like waiting for, for heaven or a dinner at the end of the month that you're very much looking forward to. It takes away from every dinner leading up to it. So that is the main distinguishable issue that I see with that. But it's, uh, yeah, it's fascinating to see people come out and, and defend it and just, and even see him like not actually have a response to anything I said and just come at me for my character and the fact that I'm being a bully. And it was just, it was very funny. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I mean, he knows very well that you're threatening what is essentially his niche, right? Because there is a lot of danger to that idea that July is a special gateway that, that you know, if you are enlightened enough, if you're aware enough, more importantly, if you follow my content, you'll be able to take advantage of, right? And so then July comes and goes and maybe you had a shit month. Maybe there were lessons in that month that you have to learn that didn't feel real great and that you couldn't recognize the importance of. And so now you're judging yourself for not being able to take advantage of this magical fucking portal, right? And so there's all kinds of self-judgment. Again, you start feeling disillusioned. You backslide even further on your progress. It just kills all your motivation. Like there's so many dangers to snake oil. And that really is the only point is that any idea that you have to hold on to to feel powerful is disempowering you. That's the reality. And so 
unless you are reminding people that their idea of themselves is not the truth, that anything they can do in July, they can do right now, that the only difference between July and June is the environment. That's the only difference. Time has not changed. It's still the same moment. It's just that the environment that time is reflecting has changed. Our rotation of the earth or our, our rotation of the solar system through the galaxies or anything like that. All the environment has changed, but the moment remains the same. So you can look at us as moving through time, or you can look at us as being in one single moment that is in constant shift, in constant flux, that we're never leaving. And that's very much the difference between feeling mortal and feeling eternal, is how much you can recognize that eternity is now. Yes. And it also, for people who you know, are looking to, quote unquote, stay present, which you always are, but people ask that a lot because it's something that seems like everyone wants to be. And the reality is that you're always present. You know, you've never left the present. We talk about this all the time. It's, it's what you are. It's the crux of your reality. It's the crux of your existence is here and now. So even, even thinking of something as, you know, July, things will be better or whatnot. Cause then, you know, you get to July, as Ray just said, and maybe things don't go great. And then you look back on July and, and feel like you missed it and then you regret it. And then, I mean, by that time, the dude we're, we're referring to probably has like seven other videos about how, you know, Oh, some of you may not have experienced July, how you wanted to, but here's another message from the universe. And it's like, motherfucker, you are the universe. Like stop talking about how you have this superior connection to the universe where everyone has to follow you so that they can get connection to the universe. It's like, that is the root. As we talked about earlier, when we first started this episode, the root is that confusion that you aren't the universe, that you are what you think you are. That is the root of all of our suffering. Every, every situation where we feel down or depressed or worried or anxious, it's because we're thinking about that fictitious idea of ourself and not recognizing that we're the entire universe. We're, we're the whole earth. We're the whole thing. We're all of it. You're not limited or confined to this idea of yourself and believing that you are believing that you have to follow someone else who's has a higher connection to the universe so that you can have a connection to the universe through them is only reinfer reinforcing that you are what you think you are. And that's what most of his messages are saying. And most of the, there's lots, there's fucking shit loads of people like that on TikTok and on social media and just out there that say, Oh, download from the universe or message from the universe. It's like, you are the universe. That's, it like that is the fucking confusion so as they say things like that it's like they are confused in saying that and there's plenty of ways we can explain how we are the universe and we have done many times so if you're just tuning into this episode you know you got 34 episodes to catch up on where we talk about all these things we we go through these episodes assuming that people have have listened or watched it chronologically so there's parts of it you're not understanding or that you have questions about Odds are we've covered it, so I urge you to go back. But yeah, that's the root. The idea that you have a connection to the universe that it isn't actually you is the root of our suffering. And that's where the confusion lies in that simple confusion or fiction. <laughs> Straight up. Yeah, absolutely. And then what's worse is that sometimes we'll actually put another barrier in the way where it's, it's not the universe that's giving me the insight. It's Jesus. Speaking on behalf of the universe, to me, the lowly mortal. So now there's like even more steps along the way. I got to look to Jesus to talk to the universe, right? So that's, that's that whole thing. And so some people settle for being like two or three down from the top of the heap, right? Knowing that the myth of those who are above them is too much for you to overcome anyway. So, you know, they're still above you regardless. They don't have to necessarily be Jesus, but if they're a priest or a pope, Right. Then they can just go, I'm speaking on his behalf and he's the big man and I know everything he would want me to say. And so there's there's again that that posturing like you have all the answers. Right. And it's interesting because even with the, the recognition, like I, I make videos about Jesus frequently ish, um, specifically about his message being very, very simple that 
love your God, and like the first, love your neighbor as yourself. And he said that, like the first, because they're the same thing. Loving God and loving your neighbor as yourself is the same thing. We're all the same awareness, and so we're all Jesus. We are all Jesus, and Jesus was us. And yet, I will have that conversation, and somebody will agree and go, yeah, but we still should worship and pray. It's like, well, you could do that, or you could stop wasting time worshiping what you could embody and just get on with it. And you can stop passing the buck. Like, if you know this is something that is possible within awareness, and it's just your idea of yourself that's saying you can't achieve it or accomplish it or recognize it, then work on that barrier, right? Stop committing to the impossibility and work on the reason you think it's impossible because that's the only thing that's limiting you. It's important to recognize, too, that even if it's someone else telling you that it's not all you or someone has convinced you of that or taught you that it's still you believing it. And I think that's where the responsibility comes in because a lot of people will say from as far as saying like, Oh, my parents forced me to go to college. It's like, it's still you to someone telling you that you're not God and you have to pray to Jesus and all this stuff. It's still you believing it. It's still you getting in the way because you're believing what someone told you. And that's basically all that religion is, is people believe it. Someone just tells them something, tells them a story, something like religion or any sort of belief system or, or what they are or anything, and they just believe it. And that's it. It's just that someone told you a story and you believed them. Like It's pretty much that simple, which is kind of seems raw and bare boned, but someone told you a story and you believed it. That's about it. And so it's important to question because not everyone has your best interest in mind, especially the church. The church does not have your best interest in mind. They have their best interest in mind. They, they are very much a powerful manipulative entity and you can see it in the rules that they create you know something like take contraceptives for example they want more people in the church so of course they're going to outlaw contraceptives because they want big families so that they become more powerful and can get more money and, and make more money or something like suicide being a mortal sin it's like they're preaching God is in paradise. God is heaven in heaven in paradise, and you'll be in eternal paradise forever. So it's like that may incentivize some people to get there a little bit quicker or want to get there a little bit quicker. So then it's like, oh, uh, shit, we got to make another rule for this one because people are trying to get there too quick and we still need their money. So that's also a sin. And if you do that, you go to hell. So then you're not going to heaven. So, so don't do that. It's like, God damn, like it's, it's not that hard to see once you start asking some questions, it's not even that many questions that are required to get to that point. It's just a few, it's just a few simple ones, but people are afraid. People are afraid of letting go of the fear and the false sense of certainty that they get from believing in something when in reality, it's only reinforcing the illusion that they are something that can even die to begin with. Yeah. And it's a hell of a journey, right? Because we come into the world completely unaware of any of these concepts in a very tiny, fragile body that still experiences pain and all of these other dualistic experiences. And then we're raised by other perceived beings that know more than us and start teaching us these concepts. And so we trust them implicitly without any idea that they're separate from us at all. Right? And we don't recognize that it's still on us to piece together what they're teaching us. Kids get that, but it's not a conscious thing, right? Because they're just 
living. They're just surviving. They're taking in the information and using it. But then as we get older, we start to de develop this idea of ourself, right? Rather than just processing the information, now there is something that is processing the information. That's not just me, right? And that thing has or does not have value. That's what cuts me off. Whereas the entire time, we're just processing. We are processing. But as soon as we have an idea of what gives us value, then we look to other people that we perceive have value and we go, oh, okay, they have value. Therefore, I should do what they're doing and that will add to my value. And then we start relating to that particular group. And then we start judging anybody who's not doing that because that also reinforces our value. And everything becomes this giant chase for a sense of worth that was never questionable until we started making it questionable by investing in this fiction, right? Because until we ask the question, am I worthy? We are the universe being worthy, right? Whatever worthy means this is why I'm not a big fan of the word deserve. You know, do I deserve this? Do I not deserve this? Deserve really has nothing to do with it. It just comes down to what direction you're going in. Why? What you're able to do moment to moment, your, your ability to tap into your potential. You can say, well, I deserve or I don't deserve, but that has that negative intonation that it's once again being granted to you by the universe rather than it being appropriate to the mindset that you are embodying. Yeah, absolutely. And there's that perception of duality again, thinking that you deserve something from something. It's like, it's just you. You're just it. And I forget which movie it was that we were watching uh, this weekend, but it, it mentioned the recognition that, or at least this is what I got from it. I don't know if this is exactly what it was talking about, that everything is always happening perfectly. And we only perceive that it is or it isn't. So when we think things are happening perfectly, we just have our idea of ourself more out of the way. And then when we think things aren't, we have ourselves more in the way, and that's pretty much it. It just comes down to our perception of reality. But you don't have to judge everything. You don't have to believe that things should happen differently because they are as they are. And, and as you let go of the idea that things should be different than what they are, you are able to have more influence here and now, but when you're a victim to thinking that things should be different or, or perceiving yourself as a victim of the way things are, it's like you, you inherently disempower yourself. And through that disempowerment, you don't have as much of an ability to influence the here and now, because you're caught up in the idea that you are something separate from the flow instead of being the whole thing. And, and through the recognition that you're the whole thing, you'll have significantly more influence over what is. But as long as you cling to that idea, you'll be limited. And this is, I wanted to get into this today because we talked about it this past weekend a bit, like what is, what is possible when we let go of the idea of ourselves? Like if we're fully able to let go and recognize that we are just everything, like how much is possible because we, we very often get caught up in, in thinking, oh, we're separate because, you know, I can control my body and I can't control your body or anything else. But is that only reinforced because we are what we think we are by the illusion that we are what we think we are. And as we let go of that belief that we are what we think we are and recognize that we're the entire universe, the entire earth, all of existence experiencing itself, will we be able to tap into the ability to interact or quote unquote, have influence over or control other aspects of our reality here and now? That's a really good question, isn't it? And I think that we have plenty of evidence um, to support that yeah, that's exactly the point that there is almost no limitation or, or any limitation at all to what's possible. But it really just comes down to us recognizing that at the moment, by and large, we live on a very superficial level of our existence. Like we are very committed to certain ideas and, and thoughts that aren't reality. 
And so the ability to align with reality is not something that we practice. There are practices such as Tai Chi and yoga and meditation, but often those become physical practices rather than the practice of a universal awareness touching base with itself, right? And that's the difference is that going through the motions doesn't necessarily mean you're getting everything out of that exercise that's possible, right? It really comes down to how you perceive yourself because meditation as the universe is very different than meditation as a human entirely different experiences. And so when you look at all that and you start looking at, uh, say, events where people have stopped thinking about themselves quite as much, and I'm specifically talking about uh, tragedies, 9-11 is a good example. All of a sudden, everybody was moving in flow. There was less of them in the way. There was less of their own need and their own lack. And there was very much a focus on what can I do for the whole? And as a result, they moved, to, they moved together and worked together really quite effectively. And you can see that in office environments as well. There's a, a training program um, that was going through uh, some of the medical system in Canada. It's called uh, Speed of Trust. And basically, it's a training program for uh, administrators to work with the people below them. And rather than dictating everything they do, rather than micromanaging everything they do, trusting them, empowering them and backing off when you go, well, I would have done that differently, or I would have done that differently. It's actually training yourself to recognize that while your idea of yourself may have done that differently, other people may have better ideas. Other versions of you are also intelligent. And so it's training you to increasingly get out of your own way. And what they found is that efficiency goes through the roof, that everybody is happier, everybody works better together, that patients that they're helping get better care, right? And so right there, we see evidence of how just the simple act of getting out of our own way a little bit, being a little less controlling, actually makes us as a whole work better together. And that's just on the surface. Now, what if you were to let go of everything, let go of all of the division from everything? Well, as you do in conversations, you start realizing people are saying the same damn things that are going through your consciousness start realizing that you're actually sharing insights with other people. We talked about this over the weekend a, a little bit, that you can be driving down the road with somebody, nobody's talking, and then all of a sudden the two of you will look at each other and say the same damn thing, right? Well, what is happening there? Well, you're both just not thinking about yourself, probably, and you both experienced an insight that you perceived separately through your own narratives, but it was the same insight, right? And so it always comes down to letting go of ourselves. So if you were to do that consciously, I think that's where we start getting into the, into the realm of Jesus and the water to wine or Jesus and, and the storm that, that was blowing over the fishing boat where there was no division. There was no perception of division. It was just go away storm. And it went and there was no separation there whatsoever. No doubt at all. The fig tree is another perfect example. I think the story of Jesus is very much the story of what is possible when we recognize that we are what is right but that is a very very deep deep insight it's one that we have to chip away at over and over and over again until we get to the point where we realize oh actually it's not the insight i'm chipping away at it's the idea of myself right and it it all like all of it comes back to that idea of yourself and because it's almost like it's like if you think of it as a circle and a circle within a circle and you are the small circle in the midst of all of existence, which I'm saying is a circle, but it's actually infinite. It's like that idea of yourself is always that first barrier. So it's not that you have to believe that you are something else. It's just that you let go of your idea of yourself and then you're automatically everything else without thinking about it. Because as long as you think that you are that something else, that's still inherently divided. That's still inherently dualistic because if you're something else, that means you're not everything else also. And so there's still very much a limit, but if you were to think of it like all of existence or even just all of, all of the earth, for example, was a circle and then you're the smaller circle within as you let go of that smaller circle all that's left is the entire earth 
So it's, it's not that you have to recognize that you're the earth. It's just as you let go of your idea of yourself, as long as you don't get caught up in something like, you know, being the awareness of yourself, because that's still limited. You just are awareness embodied. That is everything, but also nothing. And basically just not what you think you are. Then all that's left is existence is reality itself. And so it's, it's interesting to think about for sure, like what could be possible as we let go of that idea of ourself. And, you know, because even something like walking is something that we learn, we don't come out of the womb knowing how to walk. We're, we're taught that and we're taught that, oh, I can control my legs, but it's not that we're thinking about it as we walk. Like you can go on a walk and talk on the phone and probably, you know, write in a notebook all at the same time if you had if you have headphones on. So you're not thinking about all three of those things at the same time. You're probably just thinking about the writing part and everything else is just happening. So as we let go of our idea of ourselves, it's not that automatically things are going to happen. Just like when we come out of the womb, we're not automatically going to know how to walk, but you know, who's to say you can't impact reality in the way that, you know, Jesus did in different ways as you sort of continue to practice, to let go of that idea of yourself. Now that's really interesting because it's not that Oh man, this is a tricky one, right? Because if you think about it, we're, we're sitting here talking about, okay, how do I influence reality? How do I align with reality and, and, and exercise my will? Let's just say, right? You already are. That's what this is. So it's not about trying to get anywhere. It's about aligning with what you're already doing. That's the point. Right. And so as long as we're trying to get somewhere, we're getting farther and farther and farther away from the power that we already are. Right. You don't think about moving your arm. You don't think I'm going to move my arm to the left. You just do it. Right. Well, you don't think about how to run the universe. You are the universe. You're already doing it. It's already a perfect reflection of you. So really all that you're ever shifting is what you embody and therefore what your reality reflects that you're embodying and that's the question that's that's the the combination to the safe right it, it's just how many how many variations of myself can i go through before i realize that none of them are real that what remains is what is what has always been and in that state, that's when you feel effortless. There's that zone. There's that ability to just go, yeah, I got this. And it's done without thinking about it. And then later on, you're like, I have no idea how I pulled that off. And it's because you're thinking about yourself now. Now it doesn't make sense. Yeah, so it's just like a relaxing into the reality of what you already are and not clinging to something else because we so often if not almost always cling to something as we're doing something, we cling to wanting to get somewhere or wanting to accomplish something. And every time we do that, every time we strive and, you know, try and manifest this or that, or, or get to a certain place in our lives or want to accomplish something. It's like all of those things are taken away from the power that we have here and now, which is available only when we stop trying to get anywhere else at all, because any striving is energy taking taken from the reality of, of our experience here now and the potential capabilities that we have here now. So it's almost like we settle for such a shallow, superficial experience through the striving for things and stuff and whatnot, when in reality, all of those things that we're striving for, all of those things that we want and feel like we need and desire, whether it be tangible things like a car or a house or more mental, emotional things like love or 
being liked. It it all is energy that is being used for something that could be used here now. So as we let go of wanting anything at all, that's when we may be able to start to recognize some of those, I call them powers, but just abilities to influence more here and now, but it doesn't come from trying to get anywhere outside of where we are here and now, because anything that's used through our energy or uses our energy besides the recognition that all we ever have to do is relax into the reality of what is here and now will take away from our potential here now. And that's why we're so limited as far as we can tell as humans, because everyone's always trying to strive to get somewhere or accomplish something. And it's like, people will say, Oh, there's nothing wrong with manifesting. It's just a game that I'm, you know, trying to, I I can want stuff. And it's like, yeah, you absolutely can, but you're never going to reach your full potential or experience the capabilities of what's actually possible in this reality, even as a human being, as long as you keep striving and wanting. Yeah. And that's exactly what we mean by not being present is that the experience we're having suffers when we try to get to the next experience. We're just not able to see it for what it is. And as long as we're not in the experience, our ability to see what's potentially possible within that experience is very limited to the idea of what we have of ourselves, right? If I have an idea of this experience is where I want to be because that's what's going to make me happy, then the only possibilities I'm going to see are the possibilities that get me closer to that or farther away. I won't see any of the tangents to the side. I won't see any of the other things that I'm not fixated on, right? Whereas if I'm in the experience itself, then it's just a matter of direction. It's just choice, right? But we always think that our wants and our desires should govern that choice. Like, well, is it okay to want something? Absolutely, it's okay to want something. But what if I was to take two things that you want, both of which are worth $1,000, and I put them in front of you, and you want them both, which one's the right one to choose? And you'll go back and forth weighing your pros and your cons. You'll go back according to your preferences and your fears. I might not get that later. Maybe I'll get that one later. What's most likely of me getting in the long term or not getting? And you go through all that. When the simple fact is, is that neither one was the right choice. You could have chosen either one, devoted yourself to the experience of it and gotten more out of it than anything else. But instead, you're sitting there wondering which path is the right one rather than which mentality is the right one to make the most out of the path. And that's why there's no wrong decisions. There's just the inability to roll with the decision that you make, right? And we just get in our own way. But when we don't, we find that we are actually really quite fluid and that very often things that we would have never thought we would enjoy, we have the ability to enjoy. But it's when we tell ourselves we're not going to, that we can't. And that's very much what our biggest problem is as we go through ego development is that we're given the idea that having an idea of what you like and what you don't like will lead you to happiness. It's like, mm, yes and no. Having sensitivity to what you find creative or destructive will lead you to greater and greater sense of fulfillment for sure. But there is no one choice that will make you happy or unhappy without your participation one way or another. One way or another, it's your state of mind that determines the outcome. It's not the choice that you make. Yeah, it's like the saying, whether you think you can or you think you're, you can't, you're right. And yeah, it's fascinating how much of our experience is dictated based on what we think about the situation. And because we're taught that we're basically taught that we always have to have an opinion about a situation or thoughts about a situation when the reality is that you don't, you can just be the embodiment of the experience without any opinion or or wants or needs or desires about the outcome or where it's going to lead to. None of that is necessary. And and that comes back to, to the recognition that you are infinite universal intelligence expressed. Like that's what you are. So to think that you as this sort of human character, ego idea, have a better idea of what is best for you than the reality of what you actually are is inherently going to be extremely limiting. And that infinite intelligence can only be expressed through the relaxation 
of the reality of your experience right now without so much of that idea of yourself, because that confusion that you are what you think you are is what limits that infinite universal intelligence from being expressed through you. So, but we don't, because we're taught that we are what we think we are and you have to work hard and, and try hard and learn this and, and learn that we think that that is the way to being intelligent and being knowledgeable that we just have to keep do and do and do and do and add and add and add. But you are naturally more intelligent than anything you could ever possibly be through learning knowledge in a book or something. It's already there. And you are limiting that through believing that you aren't that and, and through thinking that you have to learn more or become something more or, you know, build a fucking empire. That's, that's extremely limiting to the reality of what you actually are as the most intelligent thing that could ever possibly be that can only be expressed through you when you let go of that idea of yourself and can only be expressed through you here and now, because that's all you ever are. But that idea of yourself is not here now, it's always in the past or the future, but what you actually are is always here now. I just had the most interesting thought as you were talking about that, because we talk about the Jesus story and we do talk about the idea of being able to connect with reality on a deeper level, or, or rather recognize your connection to reality on a deeper level, water to wine, healing, all that kind of stuff, right? But part of the Jesus story was the fact that he was actually joined by people who were able to recognize what he was saying more and more true they they went the other way once he died a lot of them ended up becoming the church or, or otherwise but the point was is that there was a larger and larger gathering of people that were recognizing what he was saying that's why they were coming to listen to him right themselves essentially and so it was like there was this larger bubble of awareness that suddenly just boiled to the surface and evolved more people and because of that large bubble all that potential they were able to, able to influence the whole. They were able to manifest to a large degree. So it wasn't Jesus so much as everybody that was a part of the event or the experience of Jesus. Because there was no Jesus separate from all of those other people that walked with him, right? They all fed off one another. They all learned off one another. They all evolved together, right? And that would have led them farther and farther along that path. And that is very much why I'm excited about this retreat. Because 25 people all going through this for a week in an environment where there's nothing to distract us and nothing to pull us away and make us want to feel superior is going to yield a lot of insight. It's going to change a lot of things in each of us individually, as well as in the whole, because as we said over the weekend, you don't have to go out and convert anybody. If you were to just sit in the forest or sit in your room and truly recognize that you're it, everything changes. That's all it takes because you are everything, right? And the depth of that is something that we're just starting to get into, or at least that we're just starting to recognize. And that's why I so much enjoy this podcast and this conversation, because the conversation itself is the point, not the answers, not the concepts, none of that, just the process of peeling them away. Nothing to do, nowhere to get, nothing to be. And I think that's that's part of my excitement for the retreat is that there is no agenda whatsoever we're going to eat a few times a day we're going to hang out and that's it like we wake up every day and everyone gets to do whatever the fuck they want to do like there's no requirements we're probably going to have some chats you know sometimes where ray and i hang out and talk with whoever wants to but it won't be a requirement. It's not going to be like everyone, everyone meet here. It's like, if you want to go on a walk, go on a walk. Like it's just everything that is reality will be expressed through that situation only rather than being surrounded by people who are lost in the illusion and confused that thinking that they are what they think they are. It'll be a bunch of people who recognize that they aren't what they think they are. And it'll be so much easier too, because environment does 
have a factor. So it'll be so much easier to recognize that you aren't what you think you are when everyone around you recognizes that they aren't what they think they are. And going back to the story of Jesus, a lot of the people around him probably didn't get it as clearly as he did, but it was still aspects of it. And they were able to see what he was doing and see what he was capable of and see that it was simply a letting go. It wasn't that he was this scholar who went to university for 10 years and came back and had all this knowledge and wrote all these books. He was just letting go more and more and more probably every single day. And they were able to see what was capable of someone who was able to do that. And because there probably is a geographical impact of that, potentially, who knows, there was more capability and he may have been able to feed off of that in a sense or in a way. So, yeah, I mean, who knows by the time we get to that retreat, what'll, what'll be possible, but it'll be very fun to see. And I'm, yeah, couldn't be, couldn't be more excited. Oh, the retreat's just the beginning because I think there is something to that. I think there is something to the fact that they were so close geographically. And I say geographically knowing that's not really uh, really a thing, but they were close enough in mentalities that they actually um, embodied a reality that was similar. They came together as a result of their reality being appropriate to their mentality. And so I think you're right that some people did get it to a larger degree than others. And I think Jesus knew that as well. That's why he'd say, you know, let those who have ears to hear, hear. Right. But on the other hand, there's also the story of Jesus walking through a crowd when one person touched him. Everybody was touching him, but this one person touched him and he stopped. He went, who is it that just touched me? Because he could feel the difference in their mentality. He could feel that they were actually recognizing him for what he was instead of looking at him as something up here. Right. And that's what made you know, the miracle easier to perform because he always would say, like, do you have, do you have faith? Right, because that was the whole point. It's not on me. I'm not doing this. There is no me. Right. So that all in mind, if that was in one geographic location, and now we have the internet and people all over the world having this conversation, gathering in small pockets all over the world. Well, that's not just one big bubble. That's a lot of bubbles. That's a lot of bubbles coming to the surface. And so I don't think it's necessarily just about how close we are in proximity but how close we are in mentality. And as those mentalities start to get closer and closer, I think we're going to start coming together more and more. So this retreat is only the first of what will probably end up being many, which will probably end up becoming a whole new layer to dualistic unity. So we're very excited to have the, uh, the first batch of people join us for this one. It's going to be exciting. Yeah. And, and again, for those listening who may have be interested in the retreat, it is, most of the communications are happening through Patreon um, with some communication for people scheduling stuff through Discord. We have a whole channel there. So yeah, definitely check those out if you're interested at all because probably not going to be something that you want to miss at all. Um, But spots probably won't be available for, for too much longer. So if you're, you know, listening to this or watching this long past when we when we recorded it and posted it uh, i apologize but there'll be a lot more retreats um coming up so yeah super excited for those um something else we were talking about before we started chatting was uh the idea of of star wars and the light side versus the dark side of the force so i wanted to touch on this um because i haven't seen them since i you know quote unquote woke up but I do remember them and I was actually thinking about them today a bit. And just the idea of like the Jedi versus the Sith or the light side of the force versus the dark side of the force and how the light side of the force or the Jedi will always beat out the Sith or the dark side because they are more easily able to let go of their idea of themselves. And the Sith or the dark side still clings a bit to that idea of himself and, and wants to do things like 
defeat death. And even through believing that death is something you need to defeat, you're clearly lost in the illusion that you are what you think you are. But the Jedi are able to more clearly just be the force or be the flow. I think they're more or less kind of the same things, just be the reality of what is without wanting to be anywhere else or, or accomplish anything else. Just recognize that they're it and have that impact without as much of an idea of themselves. But I think that's very interesting taking it from the aspect of, you know, what, what we talk about all the time, that the force is just the flow of reality and, and really what could we were talking about before, what could be possible and could a lot of those sort of Jedi powers be possible as we come closer and closer to the alignment and let go more and more of the idea of what we are and align with the reality of just what is here and now. Yeah, I don't see why not. It's one of the reasons I love those movies. And I love the fact that the government, which we discussed while you were here, has actually done experimentation in, into telekinesis and, and telepathy has actually, you know, had programs where they were training people and using psychedelics in order to try and break through that barrier as to what was possible. But of course, they were doing it from within an institution that is inherently egotistical and controlling. So that would have affected the outcome as well, right? But what if we were? to create a Jedi order or a Jedi Academy, right? Not in those words, obviously, copyright and all that stuff. But what I mean is that if there was actually a deliberate intention to tackle that distortion, to be aware of it, to practice getting out of its way, right? Which is exactly why I love the dialogue of the Jedi. You know, be mindful of your thoughts right? Fear leads to anger, anger leads to hate, you know, and all of this. And it's all very true. Like everything they're saying in there is very true, but it's the difference between serving versus being in control. The Jedi serve, the Sith do not. Yeah, that's, yeah. It's very interesting because they're trying to like influence or impact it I guess the Jedi is more about influence. The Sith is more about control. Like they're, they're very much outcome focused. They want to conquer this or conquer death or conquer this planet or conquer, conquer, conquer. And it's very much ego despite it's like they have the potential for it. So they're still able to have that influence or connection to the force, but it's always going to be limited as opposed to letting go of preferences and just serving what is and then being one with reality you're able to have that influence so it's the same for us in our lives as we try to control more and more the reality is we'll have less and less influence over the here and now and as we let go of control and our idea of ourselves we'll have more of an ability to have that influence here and now. And that's pretty much all it ever comes down to, but we're confused into thinking that we do have some sense of control and the reality is that we never do. So as we're able to more clearly see that and relax into that recognition that we never had control to begin with and realize that it's not something we can ever lose, there isn't fear of losing it because that's all that fear and anxiety really ever are is the fear of losing that control that you never actually had. So it's rooted in that confusion. So as you let go of that, you will actually gain influence or the ability to influence what is here and now, but it's only through the recognition that you never had any control to begin with. Yeah. But we want to oversimplify it, right? It's kind of like looking at the idea, like, my brain is in control of my body, right? It's like, well, that's a really limited way of looking at it because if your heart stopped, your brain would, right? Like everything's connected. It's all you. Your brain's not in control any more than the rest of your body's in control of your brain. It's one thing. They're not separate, right? So for us to feel in control, we have to be under this delusion that we're separate, 
right? Which means that everything we do is now conflict. Everything we do is now, it now lacks awareness and now lacks sensitivity because we're blocking out that sensitivity with our commitment to the idea that it's not us, right? That's, that's the problem. That is the only problem at the end of the day is just our commitment to it, to the illusion as truth. It has nothing to do with what we do. You can go out and pursue a career. You can go out and pursue riches. You can do any of that. But if you get under the impression that you need those things or that those things define you or create value in you, everything in your life will suffer. Everything. Because you are disempowering yourself by trying to achieve something that you feel makes you more powerful. Everything is half-assed backwards, as we said, I believe, in episode one. Yeah, it is fascinating just how much, how disempowering that idea that you need to get something or get somewhere is because, yeah, as we talk about so much, like we're manifesting every single moment. So as you desire for something or as you feel like you need something in order to become more whole and complete or even just want anything at all, you're reinforcing that you lack something to begin with. And that's all you're doing because that's what you're doing now. Manifesting isn't something that happens in the future. It's something, it's something that happens right now. So as you want for something or desire something in the future, all that it's doing now is reinforcing a sense of lack. All you're doing is reaffirming to yourself, I lack something right now. I lack something right now. I am disempowered right now because I want this thing in the future. That's all it does. And you can keep doing it. But even today, I was thinking about, you know, just for a moment trying, because I was thinking about manifesting and like trying to get lost in it and try and feel what I feel in the moment. And I started thinking about things like I could potentially want. And immediately I was outside, like taking away from my experience in the moment because I haven't thought about anything like anything like that in a while. And I was like, let's see, just like how, how it feels if I, if I start doing this and I was thinking like, Oh, I want this or I want that. And then all of a sudden I'm, I'm walking around and I'm like a block further. And I just missed out on the last block of my walk because I was caught up in wanting. And so many people are constantly wanting or desiring or manifesting. And, and we put this word manifesting on top of it. It's just, it's just wanting. It's just desiring something that you don't have already. It's just reinforcing a sense of lack. And as long as you're always doing that, so many people like spend so much of their time, quote unquote, manifesting things or desiring or wanting, like they'll spend a quarter of their day doing it and then spend the other three quarters of their day going through their day. It's like that quarter was just taken away from your day. And all you did for that quarter of your day was reinforce a sense of lack for three quarters of it. So how is that going to impact the rest of your day? Really? Like, how is it really going to impact it? It, it makes you wonder, but it's fascinating how prevalent all of that has become. And it's just very interesting to me to, to see, and very few people talk about the consequences of it. So I'm, I'm glad we are. <laughs> Well, and the problem is, is that as soon as you do, this is the problem with tackling marketing, because that's what it is in the same way as, as July is a marketing gimmick, right? And so is manifestation at the end of the day. And so the law of attraction was this huge thing, right? Like you just need to attract, attract what you want. And then of course, people like us are out there going, well, hold on. If you're wanting, aren't you attracting more lack? It's like, oh, oh yeah, that's a good point. So it's the law of assumption. It's not that you're attracting it. You're assuming you already have it. There's really no difference there. You've just reworded it. That's all you've done. You've just made it so it's easier for your ego to identify with or your ego to continue to use. That's it. That's all you've done. But you're still needing that thing. You're still focusing on yourself. Why assume that you have something that you don't when you already have everything that you need right where you are? That's the point. And until you can recognize that, your potential will always be limited, right? And that's what makes a painter able to look at a blank canvas and create a masterpiece. That's what makes a musician able to take silence and turn it into a symphony. It's their presence in the moment. It's their ability to get into the expression that they're embodying 
It's not them trying to get to the end result because the end result would be shit unless they were involved with each and every step to get there. Right. And that's very much our life. Like we can't paint our masterpiece until we are, in, are paying attention to the canvas and not just running around looking for more paint or a better piece of canvas to work with. Use what we've got. And that's where the masterpiece comes from. Amen. <laughs> and I think through that too, you recognize that you went all your life trying to get all these different things within your life or make some quote unquote, make something of your life, not realizing that you were life all along. And when you let go of, of those needs and desires, it's like you realize just being a human is pretty fucking nuts and pretty fucking cool. Like you have tools to do so many different things and things you can experience in the moment and, and live life. And it's like, we, we like to layer on all of these things on top of it. And it's like, you know, getting a car, getting a house, getting a new pair of shoes. That's so fucking superficial relative to our experience as a human. Like if, if you thought about anything that you wanted and imagined would I trade places with that thing that I want, as opposed to what I am, like, would you ever trade places with anything that you want? No, of course not. What could you possibly trade places with that would be a cooler experience than, than being a human? Like, I can't think of anything. And yeah, of course, there are tools that we can use to enjoy this experience as well, but nothing takes the place of the reality of our experience, especially when you let go of wanting and of these fe feelings of need and desire and, and all of the aspects of your life that you want to become. When you just recognize that you are life, you can actually start living and, and enjoying it because that's all you've ever been. It's all you ever are. No matter how much you confuse yourself into thinking that you're not, or you're thinking that you're something experiencing the universe or something separate from it that needs to make a name for themselves and need to have this legacy and needs to have all this cool stuff so that other people look at you in, in jealousy. It's like none of that ever compares to the reality of the moment that you're experiencing. And the fascinating complexity of and awe and amazement of being a human being like it, it it's incomparable but we write it off as because we get used to it and, and we want the shiny new thing because we want to impress the other people and it's like you don't have to you don't have to do any of that you can just and life gets a lot easier when you recognize that because so much of our stress is self-inflicted. We get stressed because we feel like we need these things. So then we rush around and, and worry and try and get to the place sooner than we should, or sooner than we, we feel like we are getting there. And every single moment that we're trying to do that, we're taking away from the reality of our experience here and now. Absolutely. Even going through our day-to-day -day life, assuming that today will be like yesterday is based on the assumption that we are like we were yesterday. And that diminishes our experience as well. That's still living within the idea of time, right? The fact is that each and every moment is a brand new universe. Each and every moment is a brand new clean slate to make the most of, right? But if you're bringing every other preconceived notion of a moment into that moment with you, that's the moment you're going to experience. It's funny how the experience of being itself is diminished by our opinion of it. It isn't until we just allow ourselves to experience it without interference that we recognize the nature of divinity, which I always find super interesting because it has nothing to do with belief and it has nothing to do with being a believer. If anything, it's the exact opposite. So on that note, we're going to 
wrap this episode up fairly quickly here, but I want to mention very quickly that while Andrew and I were together over the weekend, not only did we go out and do some karaoke, uh, we walked around a lot, went down to the beach, saw some scenery. Um, we also ate some mushrooms and we had our very first mushroom trip together, which was a lot of fun. We, we covered uh, a lot of different subjects. We watched three different movies that I'm going to recommend right now. Um, the first was The Nines with Ryan Reynolds. The second one was The Sunset Limited. And the third was The Men Who Stare at Goats. I specifically chose those three movies because of how much they apply to the conversation that we're having right now. So I encourage you to go and watch them. Whether you're under the influence or not is up to you. But either way, the movies are, are very insightful and I'm sure you'll enjoy them. If you would like to talk to us about what happened over the weekend, I encourage you to join us on any Patreon group chat. Uh, we host live free group chats as well. You can register at dualisticunity.com, but we don't typically talk about these experiences on here. So if you would like to talk to us about it in more detail, join us live and we will be happy to answer all of your questions. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm excited to, to chat about those. I may even try and watch them again before our next group chat next week because yeah, they were they were awesome, but they were so deep that as much as I got out of them, I was like, fuck, I gotta watch these like five more times, I think. But they were they were incredible. And yeah, what uh what Ray was saying before that about the recognition that you don't have to believe in anything to experience reality here and now. And in fact, your belief in anything in your in what you think you are in a God outside of yourself will only ever take away from the reality and, and potential infinite potential of your experience here and now, and your ability to fully experience and, and enjoy this experience as life in the moment. Um, so we are hosting a workshop called beyond belief, uh, July 9th and 10th. That's going to, talk all about this recognition. So if you're someone who is just interested in that conversation, if you someone if you're someone who's teetering on the edge of being religious but not really getting much of it or not really believing in much of it anymore and you're just kind of holding on because of, you know, whatever reason it is that you're holding on or you've left the church and the people around you are still in it and you're you're struggling with that or any sort of spiritual belief system or you're caught up in in the whole manifestation aspect of things and not really understanding you know the pitfalls of that or or anything along these lines of some of the experiences that you're going through in your life i think you'll really enjoy the workshop i think you'll derive a lot of benefit it will be available after those two dates but the benefit of joining is that You'll be able to ask questions live. You will be a part of the workshop. You will be the workshop just the same as, as we are. So highly recommend you get a ticket for that. It's, it's not very expensive for the amount of value that you will derive from it. I promise. Um, but yeah, super excited for that. It's happening in what about, about a month from now. Um, so you got a little bit of time, but I, I urge you to, to hop on there because tickets are also limited for that. Yep. July 9th and 10th, it's going to be a two-day workshop over the weekend. I just want to say very quickly that this specific subject is incredibly close to my heart. So I'm very much looking forward to this conversation. Andrew is right. The tickets aren't very expensive, but um, if you are sitting on the fence as to whether or not you want to participate in this workshop, I will tell you right now that it will be worth the money because you will be able to take whatever it is that you take from that workshop with you for the rest of your life, whether that's 10, 20, 30, 40 years, that experience is something that you're not going to find anywhere else. Because in all honesty, most of the time, people who are talking about it want you to believe in them. Whereas we want you to recognize that it's all about you. And that's what this workshop's about. So if you want to join us, definitely do. Uh, buy the tickets at dualisticunity.com. Uh, again, if you have any questions before that event, you want to ask us, join us in a live group Zoom chat because we can answer your questions there, but definitely come to the workshop. And it will be av available after the fact, um, but probably not for a couple of weeks after the fact. So if you're impatient, that's another good reason to get your ticket right away. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of, a lot of fun stuff coming down the pipeline for Dualistic Unity, but... Yeah, this is the end of 
season two. So yeah, we're going to be taking a, a little bit of a break here uh, to give people some time to, to catch up, but we will be back for season three uh, in a little while. But just want to say thank you very much to you for sticking with it because this has been a ton of fun. I, I know I have grown a lot in the past season you know, listening to early season one versus most of season two, it's very drastic difference. And so thank you for sticking along and thank you to Ray for, for going through it with me. I think my growth has been significantly accelerated. I'm sure that I would have come to all the recognitions that I've come to, uh, on my own, but it, it can be very helpful to, have someone who's sort of been down the path for a bit um, to just bounce things off of and, and kind of gain some different perspectives that may have taken me, you know, months to recognize uh, without, but yeah. So thank you, Ray. Thank you to all of you who have made it through 35 fucking episodes of dualistic unity. Pretty fucking cool. <laughs> Absolutely. And I appreciate the appreciation. I do want to say, as I said over the weekend, that because time doesn't exist, not only does my story necessitate you coming along, but your story necessitates mine. So as with everything to the listener, thank you for making both of our stories part of yours and possible because we're all in this together as life itself. So we'll wrap up here. We will see you in a couple of weeks. If you want to talk to us, do so on Discord or Patreon. We're always available and we'll chat with you soon. Bye, everyone.